Hey, welcome back to Venom Central. I want to thank everybody. We finally hit 2,000 subscribers. Thanks to the Wolf Pack. Thanks to everybody who's been following me and keeping up with me. I know 2,000 doesn't sound like much in the scheme of things. It's very small, but to me, it's a big deal. And I want to thank each and every one of you who've been watching my videos and have subscribed. It means a lot to me. We're trying to shed some education on this community, but I just want to say thank you very much to everybody, and I'm going to keep them coming. We're in for the long haul. But today we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to actually feed some frozen thawed rodents and <clears throat> show you guys how I thaw my stuff out, the procedures I use in feeding some of my neotropical rattlesnakes. And uh, so stay tuned. Don't go nowhere. Don't you dare click out of this. You're going to miss a good episode. But we'll be right back with you. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like and keep following Venom Central. We're just doing some maintenance and some feeding today. And I want to talk about feeding frozen dog to your venomous snakes. Um, I have a large collection, so it's a must that I feed frozen dog. Some stuff requires live, some stuff prefers live. And it's fun to watch, and it may sound like we're all a little bit psycho watching some get killed, but that's the cycle of nature. And but when you have and you're maintaining a large collection of frozen dogs, the way to go. And I want to show you the proper way that I do it, that I thaw my feeders out and test them to make sure that they're right. And uh, so let's get to it. Okay, of course we're going to start out with some sort of pail. I use a five-gallon bucket. Now, I don't go with water too hot. You don't want to explode them, of course. So I... Water temperature, I get it hot enough where I can't stick my hand in it and leave it in it too long. But what I do is I'll fill it about halfway. My rodents are in there, and I'll leave it sit for a good hour. But here's the thing. When I think that they're thawed, okay, I put my hands on every one of them. And I roll them around in my hands like this so I don't feel no cold spots. And if you try this, say after 20 30 minutes you'll find little cold spots and it's actually still ice inside that rodent i'll roll them around to make sure there's no cold spots and another thing that i do is i'll roll them around okay and i take that rodent's head and i take both thumbs and i press it down into it see i just caved its head in i want to make sure that that head cavity is still not frozen and believe it or not they can sit in warm water for an hour, and they'll still be ice inside that animal's head, inside that prey animal's head. So I crush him in, and if it goes in nice and easy, if I can get a little bit of fluid out of his nose, like that right there, you see that? That tells me that that animal is nice and thawed, and it's at the right temperature, and it's ready to be fed. And I will actually take a reading on him just to see what the temps are at. Okay, that thing is at 103 degrees. That's perfect. That's perfect. It's warm enough for a pit viper to pick up a heat signature and make a hit on it. And it's not going to hurt your animal. It's not too hot. He's not going to grab it and spit it out because it's too hot in his mouth. That's perfect temperature. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to feed some of my neotropical rattlesnakes, some of my derisas. Okay, so we're going to feed a couple of my derisas. Now... I have several different species. I've got Simmus, I've got Derisus. I, I love the new tropical rattlesnakes. But of course, we're going to talk about tools. Now, I prefer my long tweezers. Okay? I mean, in the scheme of things, they're not that long. Uh, my large hemostats, other than tweezers. The tweezers I'll use with some stuff, but you can't get a good grip on things with these for some reason. Anything that's a little bit heavy seems to slip out of them. But they still work for certain stuff, for, for pinkies and rack fuzzies and stuff. But I like my, my clip tweezers. And uh, these things are awesome. And you can actually get them on Amazon for like 18 bucks. But uh, I know that seems like it's getting a little close. But you have to feel comfortable enough to where you can do this comfortably. And having your rodent at the right temperature to incite a strike on that prey item. And not your tweezers and not your hand is the key. Okay, don't leave your tweezers sitting in your bucket like that. I've seen a lot of amateurs do this. Feeding snakes, hot water, rodents, 
They leave your tweezers sitting in their damn bucket. And they go in, take this out. This is hot up to here. The rodent's hot, it's hot up to here. You reach in to feed something, the damn snake hits the tongs instead of the rodent. Because this holds heat longer than the rodent. Or they decide to hit you in the fucking hand. So keep your tweezers out of your water. I actually just reach in and quick grab them. <laughs> so, um, one more thing. Um, feeding with tongs. I see a lot of guys feeding with them gentle giant tongs. And I use the gentle giant tongs. But I don't use them to feed snakes. I actually use them to pick up feces. <laughs> They're great at that. That big white pan on them. They can reach in and pick them up. Let me grab a pair real quick and show you. They're not comfortable enough or confident enough to use their hemostats or their tweezers. But I see guys feeding with these things and they're grabbing a rodent and they're sticking them down in the hot water and they're sticking them, just shoving them right in front of the snake's face and the snakes are biting these. Now, a venomous snake, a pit viper with a big set of fangs, they're going to bite this, they're going to break a fang off, they're going to snap a fang off, which it doesn't hurt them, but if that fang comes off too early and it's not ready to be ejected, if that snake's not ready to shed that fang, it will cause an infection and the snake wind up with mouth rot. So, the moral of the story is, use your small feeders so they're not lighting something up besides the rodent. But anyways, now I dry my rodents off. Like I said, I pick them up quickly. I just kind of reach in and quick, do a quick stab at them. And I roll them on a paper towel. And I'll explain why I, why I do this. And I kind of dry them off. And I'll grab a rodent mid-body like that. It's a little pinch, okay? And we'll let him pick up a heat signature. There he goes. Nice strike, buddy. And see, he reached right out and tagged it. And we're just going to leave it set right there for him. And he's going to start taking it down in a minute or two. Now that is a Crowless Dorisus Dryanus. I have a couple different species of these Dorisus. Let's get another one here. Where, we'll, we'll get the, the rodent ready first. And I'll shake them off real good too. I'll shake any water droplets off on them. But I dry them off for this reason. Because if you don't dry them off, okay, when you're ready to put them on your tongs, notice there's no water dripping, okay? That warm, hot water's not dripping off that rack going to feed that snake. Now, there's a reason for this. Let me put it back in there real quick. You pick up one that's wet, and you go to feed them, and it's dripping like this. It's dripping water, and that's hot water. It's dripping that warm water everywhere. When you go to open that tub for that snake, okay, you slide it open, and you're dripping hot water, that snake might pick up a reed on that hot water drops. And he's going to go for that instead of the prey item. It's going to get closer to your leg, closer to your foot, closer to your hand. It's just a rookie move. It's a rookie move. Hot water dripping everywhere and thinking he's going to go right for the rat because he smells it. They're not working on smell all the time. They're working on a heat signature. Especially rattlesnakes, pit vipers, all that stuff. I mean, they're working on a heat signature. He's going for the hottest part of that thing. Okay? So, dry your rats off. Just quick roll them around, dry them off, so you ain't got hot water dripping everywhere, and throw that snake off. He gets fucking confused. He's seeing heat signatures dropping everywhere. And what's that do to him? That confuses him. And then he gets spooked and goes into a defensive posture, and then he's going to fucking bite you. So dry him off, do it as natural as possible. You'll see me do the shake, and you'll see me tap on the surface of whatever my snake's on before I get him in range of strife. That snake's picking up that vibration of that tapping like a rodent walking towards him. Then he gets into a feeding, a predatory response strike, not a defensive strike. All right, let's feed another one here. Now this is a, let's see, I fed that one, I fed that one. This is a Dorisus, Dorisus. See, he's colored up a little. We'll do another video of showing how all these Dorisuses look with the different colors and patterns and the different subspecies. 
But we're going to let him pick up a heat signature. I'm going to give him a task when he feels it. Pop, there he goes. That's it. That's all he needs was that one little pop. We're going to drop it in for him. And we're going to close his tub back up. These tubs are really tight. All right. And moving along, we're going to move right on to the next one here. Then I'm going to shake it off, get the water off of it, and I'm going to dry it. I don't want hot water splashing all over the place. And look at him. He's already beating on me. See that? That's just from him picking up a heat signature off my body. He's coming out here like, okay, what's going on? Let's see how far we can get this guy to come out here. Yeah, he missed. That was my fault. There you go. I hope you got that. We're going to play that back in slow-mo. How he reached around, how he reached around and didn't hit this this side of the rat, he reached around and hit the back of it. He done that because the back of this rat might just be one degree warmer than the front of it. And he'll hit it again. Boom, he hit it again. And again. That's not a defensive strike. That's a predatory strike. And we're going to move on to another species of Dorisus here. This is also a Dryanus. And watch it. He's gonna, boom. That's it. He's got his got his hit in. He may hit it again. Very uneventful. He's already bit it. He thinks that he's envenomated it, which he has. He thinks it's alive. And you'll see me do this silly stuff. I call it the dead rodent dance, but I'm creating vibration for this snake to pick up on. So he thinks that he's hit it. He thinks that it's a live mouse, and he's going to come in, and he's going to swallow it. He thinks it's dead. He'll come and consume his prey as soon as he feels comfortable enough. Okay, we're going to close this up. We're going to move on to the next one. Okay, and for the last one in this rack, uh, this is a Crowless Dressus cuminensis. And you can see he's already beating on me. There you go. And he hung on like a good boy. These things are so hot. I mean, they have such a crazy venom. All these neotropical rattlesnakes. And the thing is that they're all a little bit different, too. Um, I do a lot of reading on venom and all the proteins and the enzymes. And I try to stay up with everything. But I'll tell you, um, um, the myotoxins, the cryotoxins, the hemotoxins, the neurotoxins, these guys have a little bit of everything in it. <laughs> it's just, it's wild that they're just that venomous. I mean, taking a bite from one of them would be a horrible thing. But look at how beautiful that animal is. Now, I've been breeding these for several years. You can come in a little bit closer, sweetie. He's got a rat in his mouth, okay? And... I've been trying to line breed these things. I want to breed these things where I can get a full striped one. <laughs> and I've got them about eh, maybe a quarter down. You can see how far his, his neck stripe goes. He's got a long neck stripe. And we're trying to get them where I can get a full body stripe out of one of them. But hopefully in the next couple of years we'll get it done one way or another. But anyways... We're going to move on. And we'll, well, I hope you guys like this. Um, if you like what I'm doing, comment. I'm trying to be interactive with everybody, and I'm going to try to get to all the questions. But stay tuned. There's going to be a part two to this video. I'm going to kind of compare the Simis with the Dorisus and show you some of the species that we have here. And uh, we're going to talk about Central and South American rattlesnakes. And uh, we're going to move on to other things. Um, Actually, we film in this room because it's the brightest and we have the most light in here. You know, we're going to move on to our other rooms. We have several other rooms full of snakes. Just the lighting is so bad. We're trying to figure out how to make this work. And they're a little bit smaller and it's a tighter space. And it's not real comfortable or even safe to have my beautiful wife in that room with a camera in her hand while I've got snakes out. So we're trying to work the issues out. But there's a lot more species coming. There's a lot more coming. So... We're going to move on today, and I hope you all like this video, and stay tuned for part two.